Hi, everyone, and welcome to Get Hired Live. I'm your host, Andrew Seaman, LinkedIn Senior News Editor for Job Searches and Careers. I want to welcome you to Get Hired Live. And we have so many people joining us in the stream. We have Ediana from New York City, Howard from California, Amy from Virginia, Dolores from Dallas, Timothy from Chicago, Karen from Arkansas, Jorge from Mexico, Cindy from North Carolina, Patrick from Colorado, and a bunch of people from everywhere in between. So thank you so much for joining us and keep introducing yourself into the stream. Tell us a little bit about where you're from, uh, a little bit about your job search, and a little bit about your careers. Um, and then also connect with each other. Maybe you have, uh, you know, you know where you wanna go with your career, or maybe you know where um, you um, want to work, and you see other people who are in that field or who are in that um, industry as you, and you will connect with them. Networking is the foundation of a successful job search. So what better time to start than right now? And we have such a great guest for you today. I want to welcome him to the, the screen. He is the founder of Avenir Careers. Welcome, Niatu Bensiential. Uh, you are a career expert, and today we're actually going to be talking about mental health. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Andrew. It's a real pleasure. Looking forward to having some fun, sharing some information that will help everyone listening out there and really just try to help destigmatize mental health and reinsert it into the conversation around the job search. Definitely. Sorry that my doorbell's going off, but uh, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about your background in mental health? Uh, sure. So I... <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, distractions aside, uh, New York City living, um, I wanted to be a therapist ever since I was a senior in high school. So that ultimately led me on the journey to going to Columbia Teachers College to get a master's in uh, mental health counseling or psychological counseling. Um, in that program, there was a major emphasis on multicultural competency and making sure that we were really interrogating our own identities to understand who we are, but more importantly, where our attitudes, biases, and stereotypes came from so we didn't bring that into the room as we supported other individuals in a counseling setting. Um, there's, of course, you know, learning group counseling, individual counseling, doing a practicum, working with real people, and doing clinical counseling. But in addition, we also took this amazing course called Race Lab that really had us dive into our personalities, our, our identities, and understand intersectionality and how that would interplay in the counseling room. Um, I thought I was going to be a therapist, and that was the intention in doing the program. However, uh, midway through my program, I had to take a course on career development theory, and that really turned my attention to seeing the interplay between mental health and the job search. And I ended up doing a internship at Baruch's Star Career, Devel Star career Development Center here in the city. Um, and in that career center, it was a really unique model. All the senior staff were PhD level counseling psychologists. And so we were taught to look at the whole person, not just what's your major and what do you wanna do when you graduate, but I was taught to ask who's in your family, what influences in your family as far as education levels, as far as the careers you've been exposed to, that would form the student sitting in front of me that day. And so between the multicultural uh, training, the holistic view of forming the job search and supporting the person, it's a lens I'm not able to turn off. And so that's why it's so prevalent in my work right now in terms of what I speak about and how I try to support my clients when I work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Definitely. And, you know, we, um, you know, the mental health side of job searching can be so difficult because a lot of people, what happens is they, they don't realize how taxing it can be because there's mm -hmm. rejection, there's a lot of loneliness sometimes people feel. Um, yes. And, you know, there's a lot of people job searching right now, so they feel the competition there. So, um, you know, we have a lot of people in the stream who I assume are job seeking, and we have Janelle from Texas, Melody from Indianapolis, Pooja from India, uh, Yolanda from Florida, Ahmet from Turkey, Christine from Tennessee, Derek from Colorado, and Arshad from Pakistan. And, um, you know, definitely, like you said, you have to look at the whole individual because there's family influences, there's cultural influences, all, all those make up sort of how a person job searches, what's important to them and what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So how does mental health really affect or, um, you know, how does job searching affect mental health? Sure. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by quoting you back to yourself, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, so I listened to one or two of your previous broadcasts, and it's your sign off that really caught my attention. And I wrote it down so I can read it back faithfully. Uh, remember to take care of yourself. You can only be a good candidate. You can only get hired if you're healthy and well enough to do so. 
And that's beautiful. And I'm in 100% agreement with that because that's my philosophy as well. When it comes to job searching, you have to be able to show up as your best self because it's a really long audition process, for lack of a better word, where you have to ultimately sell yourself to an employer in hopes that they're willing to buy what you're selling in the form of your, uh, your salary and employ you. And doing so can be really difficult depending on what's happening in your life. And so I'm going to try and start with an example that I hope is common to all of us. And let's talk really briefly about hunger. Uh, so, Andrew, if you don't mind, I want to ask you, when you're really hungry, I'm talking, you know, you've missed breakfast. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. You couldn't eat lunch. How do you feel and how do you act at that point in the day? Uh, angry. Um, <laughs> sorry for my coworkers for having me around <laughs> me. Um, sort of defeated trying to get through all my things so I can go get a bite to eat. Um, so yeah, it's not a good experience and not a good headspace to be in. <laughs> right. That's real. Right. And so for me, I get really quiet and a little bit withdrawn when I'm really hungry. My wife will also admit to be hangry, similar to you. And, you know, in, in these states, you and I, and we're not at our best self and our best state and might not be the most pleasant to be around and that's just hunger which is easily resolved by eating something right and so if we think about hunger as being a state of being that affects us both mentally and physically how much more if an individual is dealing with depression is dealing with anxiety or if there's some very challenging life circumstances that they're working through at the time that a job search is happening um one of the things that's very important for me to stress is that our roles don't stop just because we're doing a job search we don't stop being human right um, if you think, using myself as an example, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a son, and I'm a brother all at the same time. If I were to launch into a job search tomorrow, those roles don't just simply end, they continue and may be impacting or influencing my search. They may be taking up some of my mental space if things aren't right in a certain way in any of those areas, yet I still have to show up and be amazing in an interview or in a networking conversation every single time. And so the way that mental health impacts us is that it shapes how we are going to appear, the energy that we give off and the way that we're able to connect and convey ourselves to the audience that we're facing off of at that time. And so one concept that I'll never forget from my grad school days, uh, my wonderful professor, Dr. Annika Warren, uh, she spoke a lot, she had this theory she's working on at the time about emotional leaking and this is something that I've never forgotten. Uh, when we are in a situation where we need to perform, we do our best to cover up whatever it is that might be bothering us on that day. But inadvertently, those emotions can come out in our energy, in our body language, the way we respond or speak. Something might be off and we think we're covering it up, but, we're, but the human on the other side is gonna get our vibes. We all get vibes off of one another. It's just human instinct. We can read each other. And so if your mental health is not in the best state, it's quite possible that despite your best efforts, you may not come across in the way that you intend because there are other things going on beneath the surface. And so as you said in the beginning, Andrew, the job search is really, really challenging it's inevitable there are gonna be ups and downs and there are a lot of downs and a big factor is that there's so much out of our control in the job search. And so when you're trying to deal with all these issues, your mental health can affect how you show up. Again, there's that term showing up with how you do your research and preparation, with how you put in your effort to craft the materials, how you shape your platform. If you've got negative self-talk coming, how do you convince your, someone on the other side that you're the best fit? if your internal dialogue is riddled with imposter syndrome or questioning your value and, and your worth on the market, that's gonna come across in how you convey your messaging both on paper and in person. Um, and then of course, the interview. The interview is your major audition, it's a big sales pitch. And if there are things going on internally that you haven't been able to deal with effectively, those could leak through or they could impact or uh, downgrade your performance in the moment. And it can lengthen and prolong your job search because you're not at your best, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. And you're uh, so right. And in fact, our mutual friend, Leslie Gar, I saw her in the comments say emotional leakage is real. Um, <laughs> and you know, this conversation is definitely um, you know, resonating with people, um, you know, Deanne says, thank you for discussing this. The job search is a struggle. Amy says the rejection is a downer, especially when I think the job is a good fit for me. Um, 
Mohammed said, uh, looking forward to this, currently on a search and definitely mental health is an issue. Um, and Ediana says, yes, let's destigmatize mental health. Um, and you know, we have a question here from Kevin and it's the perfect segue into what we want to discuss next, which is how do you protect your mental health during a job search? And also, you know, protecting is one thing, but also if you're, you've been in a job search for a while, your reserves are sort of depleted. So how do you rebuild that? Mm -hmm. Wonderful question. Um, there are a few key things I like to point to when it comes to protecting and taking care of your mental health. Uh, number one is don't job search alone. As humans, we are meant to be in community. And so you might have an existing community you can leverage during your job search or go ahead and create the community and support that you need as you go through your job search. This could be the fact that you know a colleague who is also launching a job search at the same time, whether the same company or another company, connect with them and have a partnership. It just takes two to have a group and have that sort of support system, sharing resources, insights, tips, and all of that as you move forward. In addition, there are also job search groups where you could partner with some strangers and uh, form a camaraderie as you walk through a search process together. There's plenty of coaches out there who have job search uh, groups and, and, and programs that can support you. Um, and in addition, beyond getting the support you need from other individuals and having that emotional support it's also important to take care of yourself, so self-care. And so I know it's a term that's thrown around a lot, but when I say it, I mean whatever works for you and is your form of self-care, please practice it as often as you can. So for me, that's going to the gym. Uh, for me, that's spending time with my family. Uh, for me, that's uh, doing fantasy soccer, even though it raises my, my blood pressure sometimes. Um, but it's something I do enjoy and I love the game. And so those are things that I try to engage regularly to uh, replenish my reserves because if we're filled up internally, we can pour out into our our families, into our relationships, and also into our job search as well. Um, in addition, I think it's really important to monitor your self talk. I've written a lot about the internal narratives that we have and how those narratives that might come from things we've been told as a child, things we've been told by society, uh, things that we've been told, negative feedback from the job search itself. All these things don't necessarily just go away. They are absorbed somewhere within us. And others, some of us are more resilient than others in terms of how we deal with it. But all of us have some challenges sometimes in terms of that script or narrative internally that might be challenging our self-worth, questioning our ability, questioning our value and ability to contribute. And so it's really important to try and capture those thoughts in real time, challenge them, and reframe them in a way that makes them more positive and closer to the truth. Um, in addition to that, I'm a huge proponent of therapy. Um, I personally uh, am in therapy uh, bi right, right now, it's bi-weekly. Um, and it's a place that you or I can use that is fully dedicated to you, to me, with a professional who is trained to help you sort through your stuff. Uh, we all have stuff, <laughs> whether it, it's related to relationships, our upbringing, present challenges and stressors. We all have things we need to deal with. And that space is 100% yours with no judgments and enables you to really work through things, try new ways of being, normalize and validate your experiences, um, You know, just give you space to process. And you can also develop healthier coping skills. Uh, help you to set boundaries, identify and clarify your values, and also just learn how to navigate relationships better because a therapy relationship is a relationship. And so those are a few of the ways that really come to mind in terms of um, how to protect your mental health. And then get into your second question, which relates to how do you rebuild things after you have suffered some of the slings and arrows of the job search? Um, I think that if you can, if you're able to taking a step back and taking a pause, to evaluate what you've been through uh, to date in that job search if it's been a prolonged one. Try and understand what's worked well and what hasn't worked well for you. Try and look at the different ways you're measuring your success in the job search, because for too many people, we define success uh, in terms of I have a job offer or I don't have a job offer. If that's your only measure of success in a job search, everything that falls short is failure. And that's incredibly unhealthy and demotivating as you go through your job search. And so think about other ways to measure your progress. How many networking conversations are you having on a weekly or monthly basis? How many new companies have you identified that you might want to work with? Um, how have you improved the quality of your pitch and your content? Is your resume better? Maybe getting more results as you send it out. So try and find additional markers of progress and success that don't rely solely on you having landed a job, which is obviously the ultimate goal. But there's so many things that take place before that point 
that are ways to ensure that you're moving forward and making steady progress. And it's, it's, incredibly hard to maintain that level of motivation. But I think the other piece is not letting a lack of progress reflect and, and damage your self-worth. I just want to reaffirm to everyone out there that you have inherent value just because you're you and just because you're here. Uh, whether or not an employer is seeing that, I feel that that's on them. You just haven't found the right, you haven't found the right employer yet that sees your value. And so really try to challenge that and turn that around and don't judge your whole you know value or platform on the fact that you haven't gotten a yes you haven't gotten a yes yet mm -hmm. yeah no and i think that i think that's so important and what you mentioned is that you know your a uh, your current state as a job seeker does not determine your self-worth and you know when people are rejected a lot of times they get upset and they say you know oh you know it's because i i am worthless i don't have the skills or something like that and really a job search decision or, or a hiring decision it there's so many factors that go into it so it, it's mm -hmm. not you can't just say oh it's this or that uh it could be that the hiring manager's cousin applied and there was nepotism <laughs> or something like that yeah uh, yeah it's, it's so difficult to actually untangle a lot of those things and mm -hmm. we're getting a lot of questions um from people about sort of this intersection of job searching and mental health and i want to remind everyone in the comments to please get their questions in and we'll be taking them and i want to start off with one that seemed to resonate a lot in the comments and it, it's from kathy and she she basically uh, told the story of her husband who was let go from his job um, as an, and he, he's older, an older job seeker, and he has a college degree, but um, obviously older workers have a much more difficult time in the job market um, than others. So if you're uh, Gen X or millennial or Gen Z, um, typically you'll have an easier time than older job seekers. And Kathy says it's taking a toll on his emotional and mental health. And then we have a lot of other people, Teresa agreed with ageism being an issue and a lot of other people in the comments. So for people who are older, what is your advice to them to, for job seeking, but also to sort of withstand the struggle and challenges that they'll face in the job market? Sure, um, it definitely is a, a very real challenge. I wanna validate all those out there who are feeling the potential pressures or roadblocks due to ageism. It is a thing that's out there, but what I want to encourage them to do is not have it be at the forefront of their mind and for them to make it a bigger issue than it might potentially be in that you have control of your narrative. You have control of how you present. And so if you want to make it a thing, it will become a thing. But if you try to find ways to tell your broader, bigger story, that's your avenue or your pathway around the ageism issue. Um, I think that it's important to remember that you're looking to demonstrate what you can do, not in spite of your lengthy career experience, but because of your lengthy career experience. So you may have seen every single flavor of challenge within your industry because of your longevity. You may have been able to find 10 ways to solve a crisis that someone who's half your age would not know even the first solution in terms of how to do it. So perspective and experience are incredibly valuable. I come from a culture where you respect your elders and you look to them for advice because they have a lot to offer. So I value that experience. And so you'd also want to think about what organizations might value my track record versus organizations where they typically tend to hire younger. Um, I remember a stat that around please I, don't quote me on this, but at an organization like Goldman Sachs, about 40% of uh, the the individuals are you know under 40, 40 years old, something like that. Like it's a crazy stat in terms of how young the population is, especially as you get to slightly more senior levels. And so it's a business that tends to hire young and it's obviously a large business. Look at maybe smaller size companies, mid-sized companies, small companies where they would value your depth of expertise and you can cater your job search to look for organizations that would need your ability to maybe work across a large range of issues versus being a specialist. And so you wanna try and essentially carve out your own lane by saying, what has my experience brought me? What can I do differently better than anyone else because of my experience? And then try to seek to match that those offerings that you have to companies that value that experience. Um, in terms of defending and and um, coming out of the challenges of, of feeling the defeat of ageism, again, it, it's easier said than done. I want to be very fair in acknowledging that, but it's about trying to 
look for those opportunities where you can add value and not forgetting you have plenty of value to add. Um, if a company is not willing to work with you because they think you're too old or that you might be too expensive, which is another you know sort of cliched um, way to to dismiss someone who's of an older generation, um, you want to it, it's their loss. You're looking for opportunities where they are going to value what you have to bring and know that there are places out there for you. It's just a matter of looking maybe a little bit harder and working through your network to find those opportunities where you can fit in. But don't take yeah, it personally. <laughs> definitely. And I, I think what you said at the beginning is so important too. The, men, the mentality of it is important because if you show up assuming that they're going to be against you because of ageism, um, it's really going to actually sort of telepathically get into them. Because I remember when I was learning uh, you know, to be a reporter in the field, one of the things I had to do was go into this giant room and basically ask all these people their age. And as someone who grew up being told never ask someone their age, and you know, especially if they're older than you, I carried a lot of baggage because I was like, oh, I know this is a sensitive question, <laughs> but how old are yeah. you? Um, but one of the older reporters told me, you know what, just ask them their age, be direct. Um, and that was, you know, during reporting. And, and it turned out that people were much more willing to actually tell me how old they were when I didn't put that stigma on there. So if you come mm -hmm. in with a stigma saying like, oh, I'm older or something like that, it's going to really transmit during that interview. And then also what I always tell people, and I think I fall into this trap now that I'm getting older, is that when you're young, you go into a job interview saying, you know, I'm going to do this, this, and this for you. And mm -hmm. when you get older, you say, this is what I've done for other people. And an employer is uh, very selfish and they don't care what you've done. They care what you're going to do for them. So Right. What can um, you do for me right now? What have you done for me lately is kind of the thing. Um, another point I forgot is that, you know, your experience can allow you to provide mentorship. Um, maybe your the salary is not a concern for you because you've been fortunate or, or blessed enough to make your money by this point. And you're really looking to give back and invest in whatever company you're joining. There's a lot of value for you to be able to provide that wisdom and guidance based on your experience. And, you know, <laughs> you, you're, you, you're someone who likely has kept up with the times or is at the very least adaptable. And you might have great, great command of current technology. You might have a great feel for where the industry is going. And so find ways to demonstrate that you are up to date and that you are current in terms of industry trends, current knowledge, current technology. And those are ways to defend against any stigma that the interviewer might have on their side or any biases. And again, as Andrew was saying, if you come into the room already worried about the ageism factor, you're conceding ground before the first words have been spoken. And so you want to be on the front foot and be ready to demonstrate what you have versus starting from a place of deficit, a deficit mindset in terms of your age. No, you have a lot of value. Lean into that and offer that. Yeah, and we have a question here that um, I think is really good from Sarabi who asked, how do you stop thinking about lost opportunities and come to terms with this loss to be able to move on to the next stage? How to train your mind to stop negative thinking? Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people, especially job seekers, they fall into the trap of falling in love with the job before they have it. And then mm -hmm. they're sort of crushed even more than they uh, would normally be when they lose the opportunity. So what's your adv advice for people like Sarabi and others who, you know, they they just feel crushed by getting rejected. Sure. Uh, fear of missing out FOMO is real. So again, let's just validate, acknowledge things we all experience and feel. Um, but when it comes to job search, my advice is to try and get ahead in terms of your networking process. We've all might have heard the term that the hidden job market, and it's real. Uh, Many of you might have experienced that there's an opening that occurs within your team or department or group. And obviously, you know about it very early. It's possible your management or HR might ask you to refer people very early on. Who do you know? Do you know any people who might be good candidates to fill this slot? So the insider has that access and knowledge of the job is open before it ever gets posted online anywhere. And there's a stat saying that about 70 to 80 percent of positions never actually get posted. And so if you're worrying about reacting, and I use that word intentionally to a posting saw online, it's possible that opening has been live for two to four weeks before it even appears anywhere online. And the individuals who are networked into the company through friends and former contacts are already ahead of you in the queue in terms of being referred into that opportunity. So I think the best defense against fear of missing out in terms of lost job opportunities is to go on offense, really start tapping into and building your network up 
so that you can be the first person top of mind when something that you're an amazing fit for comes open at a friend, a former coworker, your uncle's, you know, uh, office nepotism is, is real. Um, but you know, you use, we, you all use the connections that we have in life to get ahead, whether it's getting into the club that you want to get into, cause you know, the bouncer, or if it's getting you know, a job because you used to work for someone or someone was a former client and you did amazing work for them. It's the truth of how the world works. And so I just want to encourage you to take advantage of how the world works and intentionally build up that, uh, that network of yours so that you can be at the front of the line when opening comes good. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we have a, this is some somewhat related to FOMO, I think, from Sarah. How do you manage your mental health when comparing yourself to others? Oh, that's a, that's a dangerous game. Um, <laughs> um, there's, I, I wrote this post with this big Sean quote, that's a word to effect of, if I compare my mission to your mission, it's no longer my mission, something along those lines. Um, and so, <laughs> Uh, they also say comparison is the thief of joy, right? And so it's really important, no matter how big the temptation is, and we all fall into that trap, to focus on running in your own lane and telling your own story. Um, my story is I was born in London, grew up in New York City, finished high school in Ghana, did a year in France. I've been in HR, at Merrill Lynch, recruiting. I've been, uh, I've, I studied mental health. I worked at Ivy Exec counseling mid you know, of executives. I had this whole wave of experiences that make me who I am today uniquely. And so no one else can tell that story that I just told because it's mine. The same way that all of you out there have an incredibly unique story that only you can tell. And so why should I try and copy Andrew's story um, or, or Ellie who's behind the scenes, you know, helping us with technical stuff? Why should I copy their story when mine can stand alone and I can offer things that neither of, them, neither of them can by virtue of my personal experiences. And so it's trying to figure out what it is that you bring to the table, what you do better than anyone else with your own flavor, and try to market and run on that. Because two people can have the exact same education levels, all the same certifications, have held similar titles going all the way up, but they can take two completely different routes, the same a uh, solution that a company values. And so if you're able to articulate that different path you take to the same valued solution and yours sounds cooler or fits in better to that company's uh, culture and way of doing things, that's how you stand out versus the other person who can also arrive at the same solution, but your way of doing it, your flavor, your style, uh, your MO is just a better fit. That's what gets you ahead versus worrying about what anyone else is doing. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important point. The grass will always be greener and there's always a new lawn in the horizon. <laughs> um, but, you know, focus on what you want and what's important to you. And, um, you know, we have a question here from Daniel, and I think this, is, this goes along with the rejection part of it, which is employers ghosting has been the most difficult for me. What advice do you have for this situation? And for people out there who don't know, ghosting is basically, um, it's not just you don't hear back, it's after you've had a conversation with an employer. So maybe you've had an interview, maybe you've had a few interviews and all of a sudden the recruiter, the hiring manager, the potential employer just doesn't get back to you. So it's not just these people applied, it's that they actually um, have had some engagement with an employer and then just no communication. So Daniel basically says, you know, what, what should people do when they, they experience ghosting? Because that could be sometimes the worst rejection of all. Yeah, certainly. Uh, when people, you know, fade to black or ghost you, it is not cool, <laughs> for lack of a better word. And, you know, the hope is that we can insert more of the human element into back into the job search and, and hiring process so that candidates aren't ghosted. But I want to insert grace on both sides of the equation. Um, there could be myriad things happening behind the scenes at the employer that we'll never have access to as the candidate that have put a freeze a complete stop or reversal of direction on the opening. Uh, there could be budget issues. There could be a million things going on. Uh, maybe someone went on vacation, it's August, <laughs> and they can't move forward to the interview process. Um, so many things, but on the employee side, sorry, the job candidate side, which is my the, the side that I represent, um, I would counsel you to be persistent to the best of your ability. And so this looks like putting in uh, a decent cadence of follow-ups at a time that you 
can trust your judgment to, uh, to, to leverage in terms of follow up. Maybe it's been three weeks since your last interview, you've heard nothing. You're well within your rights within a two to three week window if they haven't given you uh, any feedback to check in. And you can keep on checking in at a cadence that is not badgering, of course, uh, but is demonstrating your level of interest for the role until you might receive a clear no. I don't think following up hurts until there's a clear and definite answer, because if it's a role that you do care about, then you're invested in trying to get a clear answer from the employer. And it's quite possible that the individual who persists might end up with the job. And so I'm not saying this is a blanket true all over the place, but um, you are putting in your best effort and controlling what you can control to follow up. And that potentially can keep you top of mind and on their radar, and hopefully they will get back to you. So persistence in communication uh, until you get a clear no. And sometimes it might be just come to terms of letting it go and may come back to you. Uh, there's someone on this call um, who may have applied to a job a year ago and out of a the blue, they get a call back and get the job offer. Um, and that is, could be your story as well. So keeping top of mind and stay in contact is the best advice I can give, but don't stop the job search. Keep on going until you sign something and don't wait on anyone to get back in touch with you. Definitely. And what I always tell people too is don't bring your bridges in those communications. I think a lot of people, mm -hmm. they can get caught up in their emotion and sort of say, you know, how disrespectful and all this stuff. And, <laughs> you know, maybe the recruiter went on vacation for two weeks. You don't know. Um, yeah. So you don't want to burn those bridges. And, um, you know, for a last question, I, I have this one that, I, you know, we've never gotten before, but I think it's so, so great. It's from TJ. And TJ says, what other approaches to the infamous question? how's the job search? So what what would you suggest, you know, if someone's struggling, maybe they've been out of work for a while, they're getting rejections, or someone says, how's the job search? How would you suggest they answer? Hmm. Yeah, I really like this question. I've never, <laughs> yeah, never got yeah. it. That, that's really interesting. I mean, my my gut is to, to just be honest. Um, one of my, my favorite pieces of advice from one of my old supervisors was just be a person. Uh, and when she said this to me, this was when I was, you know, a baby therapist, you know, in training and thinking too much about the process and the techniques I wanted to use, what I needed to get to in terms of my questions. And she said, don't worry about, about all that. Just be a person, be in the room, be present. And so in that interaction, of course, you have to use your best judgment in terms of who the audience is, who you're talking to. Um, but you never know what the response will be when you lead with honesty and you lead with empathy. And so if someone's asking you how it's going, hopefully they really actually care and want to hear what's going on. And I think I'd guard against turning it into just a pure venting session. But if you can be specific about what the challenges are, what has worked and what's not working for you so well, where you might feel stuck and might need some help. You never know what can be unleashed if you can share transparently with someone what you're going through. And I guess my, as I think about this out loud, offer precision in terms of what those challenges are. The more specific that we are with our feedback to individuals, any sort of conversation, the better they are able to assist us. And so if it's simply, I'm not getting any callbacks, that's really broad. Um, you know, I don't know if I'm telling my, my story right on my resume. I don't know if my pitch is solid and landing when I tell people what it is I'm interested in. Um, I'm having trouble networking into the companies I'd really love to work for. I think if we can be more specific, then the listening party can say, you know what, I might have a solution for you, or I know someone who can help you with this particular issue. And so off the top, I think that's the best advice I can give. Just be honest and be specific. Yeah, definitely. And I think you know, the whole thing is I always tell people is when they always tell me, you know, I'm looking for work. And even if they have a job, I always say, well, did you tell your friends? Did you tell the people that you know that you're looking? And they'll always sort of look at me and go, oh, God, no. And uh, <laughs> because they think there's some shame in it. But really, no one can help you. No one can uh, step up and say, hey, you know what? I think I know something that would be great for you if you're not honest about it. If you're going around telling everyone, thing, everyone everything's great, everyone wants to give me a job, and that's not the truth, then you know they're going to say, oh, I guess you don't need help, and or me, you know, we have a job open at my company, and I guess you don't need that. Right. Um, so you know, it's important to be honest and say, hey, you know, listen, if you know of anyone who needs, you know, an accountant or you know who's hiring for you know whatever the role I'm looking for. Um, 
um, you know, that that's important too to let people know that, you know, hey, you know, if you know anything, let me know. Um, and that's part of networking. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd love to just yeah. very briefly pick up that point about the stigma around job searching itself. Um, I wrote a post uh, back in Jan February, I think it was about <clears throat> the open to work hashtag on LinkedIn itself. And I was challenging the stigma associated with people having that banner on their profile. And I was really taking issue with the fundamental assumptions around people being devalued if they're out of work or looking for work and what it means to also ask for help if you're looking for work. And it makes zero sense to me that there should be any shame or stigma around declaring an openness to find a job. Everyone has been out of work at some point in their career, uh, it might be different uh, periods of being out of work, but everyone has or will experience it at some point. And so how can we shame people for something that everybody goes through? Um, and so it's really important. I just want to encourage and validate everyone on this call that there should you shouldn't feel any shame uh, in terms of job searching or, or looking for help in terms of uh, getting to where you want to get next. We are all at some point going to be in this position. And we would hope that were the tables turned or reversed, that we would be able to offer help uh, that we would need ourselves at some of the point. And so asking for help definitely takes courage. People have different relationships with asking for support, um, but doing the inner work around your hangups or, or apprehensions or anxieties around asking for help is part of that mental health journey that can support you in advancing more quickly in your job search. So there's uh, this you know, often quoted African proverb, which we don't know which African country comes from, but if you want to go uh, fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And so when it comes to your job search, if you wanna go far, please go together and get support. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And again, the main underlying message of this is take care of yourself so you can be your best self as you network, as you interview, and as you show up to those late nights searching online and writing resumes, you have to be your best self across all of that in order to get the results that you want. Yeah, definitely. And actually the feature you're talking about, that little green banner that says open to work. I remember there was a lot of uh, discussion about whether it made someone look desperate. And it turned out people who turned on that banner received 40% more messages from recruiters and 20% more messages from people just throughout their community. So, um, you know, people were seeing it and actually trying to help, um, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, and I, like you said, be your best self, be your authentic self, and um, hopefully you'll go far with that. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you so much, Niatu. This was such a wonderful conversation and I hope everyone uh, will follow you at the link below on the screen. And obviously you're tagged in uh, the post for the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you so much for this opportunity, Andrew. It's been just a pleasure to get to chat with you and chat with the amazing audience that's showing up today. And I just want, you know, I hope everyone took away something that will help them move forward. And again, you know, there's no shame in seeking therapy, seeking support um, and taking care of yourself. We all have mental health. And so why should we, you know, be shy about supporting it and protecting it? Definitely. Yes. And thank you all for joining us out there. Um, you know, I'm sure you took a lot away from this conversation. It, I, I took a lot away from it as well. Um, and just a reminder that we always have conversations happening on this channel for the LinkedIn News. And in fact, on Monday, my colleague Nina Melendez will be talking to a Harvard Business School professor about the pros and cons of pay transparency. And that's at on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern time on the LinkedIn News channel which is where you're watching this right now. Um, and then on Friday, because I'm here on Fridays at 11 a.m. during the summer, we'll have this uh, Jonathan, who's the CEO of uh, OneSulting. Um, he's the founder also, and that is on Friday, August 27th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And if you click the link, um, you'll see uh, my producers are dropping it into the chat right now. You could RSVP, and then you can also um, you know, click on the link above, it'll be in the post as well, and you'll get a notification when we go live. Um, as always, thanks so much for joining us. I had a great time chatting with all of you and also with Niatu. And until next week, please take care of yourself. Obviously, the pandemic is not over, and you could only be a good candidate. You can only get hired if you're safe and well enough to do so. So be sure to take care of yourself. And also, until next time, best of luck.